All righty. Welcome to the Celtics Lab podcast. I'm your host, Cameron Tebetabai. I'm joined by Alex Goldberg and Dr. Justin Quinn. We've got a lot on the agenda today. We're going to talk about Joe Missoula becoming the official head coach of the Boston Celtics. We're going to talk about the All-Star Game. We're going to talk about the buyout market. And later in the episode, we're going to talk about this box of Wicked Smart, Marcus Smart cereal that I bought. But that's later. First, we're going to welcome in our guest today, comedian Gary Goldman, who comes back to the pod. Gary, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. I, I consider myself now a, a friend of the program. Is that? Oh, oh, oh yeah. the feeling yeah. is mutual, Gary. I was I was interim friend. And yeah, now <laughs> I'm friend. Yeah, uh, we don't have we don't talk about the old friend, but you are no. officially at long last the friend. Um, Gary, you are on tour, the Born on Third Base tour. You're coming to Burlington, Vermont, Northampton, Massachusetts, and East Greenwich, Rhode Island in March and April. Uh, you want to sell us on that tour of yours? Oh, I think I think it continues in the grand tradition of my being funny live. So <laughs> I would say if you've, if you've enjoyed me live or even live on tape, I, I would say you will enjoy this this show, which is which has been really fun. And I've been working on it for my word over a year now. So it's really strong. Uh, There's clips that keep on coming up in my algorithm with various Gary one-offs, which I've been enjoying lately. So okay. make sure to also follow Gary on all socials, like subscribe and get more information about the tours that way. Yeah. I don't know if you saw my tribute to the three, three point contest today on my, on my, that was good. Instagram, but I, <laughs> I made some nice, I made some nice three point jumpers, although I I'm still so shocked to see how slow I am. <laughs> Well, that's I was thinking Horford deserves to be in it because he's such a good shooter, but he'd only get like three or four shots off. I know he really uh, takes with the clock. Time. Um, Gary, can I ask you're you're stopping in Hawaii on the tour? Have you ever toured Hawaii? I'm yes, a long time ago, I think in 2006 or five, I did a, a show in in Honolulu at a laugh factory that I don't think is there anymore, but this time I'm doing the the blue note, which I think is a jazz performance club so but they have comedians there i'm really looking forward to that uh, i went to hawaii with my wife last year for valentine's and we love it there so i'm I'm really excited very grateful yeah that's uh with res- i love burlington vermont but that's a cut above <laughs> you know. they don't they don't send basketball podcasters or history teachers to honolulu just because so oh my god uh, enjoy dreams yeah send me a postcard all right we're here to talk about the celtics gary goldman obviously you're a comedian but you're also uh, quite knowledgeable about the Boston Celtics. So I'll go to you first. You already kind of teed us up. Joe Missoula today became the 19th head coach of the Boston Celtics. Um, initial reactions, I'll go to you, Gary. We'll go around the horn. And then I want to ask people about their favorite Celtics coaches of all time. Um, but first, just initial reactions, Gary. I I was wondering the other night with, with a couple of comedy friends, Dan Bolger and Josh Gondelman, I said, well, why, why have they taken so long to take the interim tag off of Joe and they they weren't sure they thought it might have something to do with the Ime's contract but I I thought it would have been a nice it was great last that it came out today but I I thought it would have been nice if it came out after the after the Milwaukee Bucks loss which was a win it was a it was a win because I've I've never felt that way about losing an overtime game (laughs) I I felt like my word, what a special team we have here and and what a great way it would have been to say this is this is what we're, we're about as the Celtics organization and and take the interim off. But I'm sure there was a lot more going on that I that I'm not privy to. Sure. Uh, um, I don't think we know that much yet. They said that they agreed to a new contract. They haven't disclosed any of the dealings. So um I don't know. Maybe Missoula had other offers that we'll find out about later. I, I'm not reporting that, obviously. Justin, uh, thoughts or anything we missed? Well, the, actually, that is kind of the thought process that unfolded in my head was really awesome for Ime, or for me, really awesome for Joe. Uh, then I immediately turned to what happened with Ime, because we don't know, as you said, the, the details of what's going on, but the general consensus is that it's probably illegal. Uh, issue that they will have to fire him uh, if they make him. Yeah, I saw it was him. reported today that they have officially cut ties with him and no one has expanded on that, but that he is no longer employed by the Boston Celtics. Yeah, I've been being a lazy bum today. Uh, being a it's your birthday. Yes. That's fine. Um, anything else, Alex? Anything? 
Um, just, you know, congratulations to Joe Mazzula. I think um, a lot of people did not expect that he would be so effective at coming into this job early this year, given the tumult that uh, was the offseason and Ime Udoka's departure from the Celtics so suddenly. Um, you know, Missoula has coached the Celtics now to the best record in the NBA. Um, he is the captain of the all or the coach for the All Star team uh, in the Eastern Conference. His first game as a full time NBA head coach, non interim edition, will be the All Star game, which is pretty funny and interesting. Oh, that is good. And um, yeah, you know, I think that Joe has had um, some kind of timeout things and weird little wrinkles and occasionally, you know, uh, charged interactions with press and media that I think some Celtics fans have kind of been criticizing him a little bit uh, over on social media. And we can get into that at some other time. But uh, the fact remains that the record speaks for itself. Joe Mazzula is a really good coach and he is eminently qualified for this job. So I'm happy for him and I'm happy for the Celtics who seem to have really found their guy and in particular Jason Tatum's guy. Yeah, uh, the Jason Tatum vote of confidence came out immediately and has been consistent. Um, yeah, it's it's shocking that he's 34 years old. Uh, <laughs> that is that just blows my mind. Um, one of the youngest coaches, I think third youngest coach in NBA history now officially. Um, Gary, do you have a favorite Celtics coach of all time? Yes, I, I would say it would be Casey Jones. I, I really, great pick. Yeah, I really loved him, and and the the teams he coached were great, and they they all give him credit. And and we've seen it's not it's not easy to coach a super team, and and those were super teams, but also facing other super teams at the at the time. And and I th- I thought he did it with with uh, such grace, and and was was a Celtic player, so that 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 put some higher in my mind as a, just a dedicated guy. So yeah, Casey Jones was my favorite. Alex, what are you? Uh, my favorite Celtics coach of all time is actually not a guy who was ever a head coach for the Boston Celtics, but rather an assistant coach by the name of Evan Turner. Mm. Um, I just, I just thought that story was so delightful that Evan Turner came in for one season as an assistant coach under Brad Stevens. And it seemed like he just had an immediate and instant locker room connection with all of those guys. Obviously he played with some of them, so that helps, but you know, I really enjoy Evan Turner as a basketball player, media presence, and just general NBA person. So my favorite Celtics coach of all time from an assist generally is, is Evan Turner. I think Um, from a head coaching standpoint, you know, I got to be honest, I, I only kind of came into the Celtics as a fan of the KG Pierce Rondo teams. And while I like Doc Rivers, I never really was like, it, you know, all in on Doc Rivers is the future of the team. Um, my favorite Celtics coach of all time, I think, is actually probably Joe Missoula, but at least from a head coach standpoint. Nice. Dr. Quinn? For me, it's probably pretty obvious for anyone who knows me pretty well, it's going to be Bill Russell. Yeah, uh, you own that. I think you've done the legwork to own that one. Um, kind of similar to Alex, I feel like uh, my Celtics fandom really came on- online during the Jim O'Brien era. And when you're a kid, you don't like the best you can do is like read the standings in the newspaper. You don't really know what's going on, I don't think. <laughs> so I, only looking back, do I realize that the Jim O'Brien era was, I guess he has, I'm looking now, I have they had a, above 500 record, but I don't think he's in like, you know, the, the pantheon of great Celtics coaches with respect to. Uh, Jim O'Brien, but I'll I'll shout him out. Anyways, uh, we'll keep it moving. The Celtics are about to go on break because it's the All Star Weekend. Um, Tatum, Missoula, and Brown are headed out there. I I think all indications are that Brown will play, although we haven't seen him play since he broke his face. Um, he definitely then, wants to play for sure. Yeah. yeah, and I think he'll he'll go, and he's healthy enough to enjoy all the fun, whether or not he plays for more than a few moments. Um. Gary, you talked about that that gritty almost went against the box, very shorthanded. Um, that came after two just like shellackings against the Sixers and the Grizzlies. And then last night, Detroit did not give the Celtics many problems. Where are you at with the Celtics as of late, Gary? Oh, I think I think they're playing some of their best ball of the of the season. I think it's got comparable to the first few weeks of the season in terms of shooting. I I I was so impressed by how Marcus Smart came back 
<laughs> after missing 11 games. And I mean, maybe his shooting might have been off. I, 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 he's an unpredictable shooting anyhow, but I was just so impressed with that. And if that's the way guys are going to return from injuries, and we also realize that Derek White is an all star and Malcolm Brockton is an all star, and Mike Mascala might be the steal of the of the trades. I mean, it's an embarrassment of, of riches and it's, and it's, we, we were in a really great position going into the all-star game last year. And I think the advantage this year is that we've been to the finals. And I, and I think that's a, that's a, 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 a tremendous value in, in terms of preparation and experience. I, I think I, I'm afraid of of the Phoenix Suns and and the Nuggets and some teams in the in the West, but I feel over seven games. I, I think we have to be favored. I favor the Celtics to win the uh, Banner eighteen. Wow, I mean you're right. I mean you're probably right. This is their best record at the All Star break since 2011. So I mean they're world beaters of a sort. Um, Dr. Quinn and then Alex, I'll go to you. Where are you at with the Celtics either the past week or all season? So I've been looking at the same thing from a more cynical kind of perspective in that I'm getting really tired. And now it's kind of touched on this earlier. Celtics fans are so obsessed uh, with making this team completely airtight from top to bottom, scouring the entire world of basketball for whoever they could possibly add on the buyout market. Not that we're going to do that or anything, uh, but Generally speaking, people are jumping all over Joe Missoula because he has the best record in basketball. I'm confused <laughs> why we are angry at Joe Missoula sometimes or with Grant Williams for botching a play after how many people are not playing for the Celtics that start normally? I mean, I'm very, very happy. Don't get me wrong. But <laughs> really good time to be a Celtics fan right now. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, the... I put some negative energy out there on Twitter. Ah, people didn't like it. Uh, yeah, that being said, for people who haven't made a, a hobby or a side hustle or a living out of you know being hyper specific about the Celtics, it's so fun. It's so fun to root for the Boston Celtics. I mean, obviously we are a little bit homers, but we try to be measured. But if that was not my mandate, goodness gracious, this is such a fun team to root for. And so much of that comes from the fact that they like rooting for each other. That the just like the this is so overdone, but the vibes are immaculate. Yeah. Uh, yes. Blake, Blake Griffin uh, and Luke Cornett alone have brought so much joy to me um, yeah. as a fan. Um, Alex, yeah. where are you at with, with the, oh, Gary, yeah. Sorry, just when Blake dove last night and and Marcus's face, it was just, uh, it really, it was moving. I loved it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was ecstasy. And, you know, I think that kind of gets at exactly why this team is so fun to watch because, you know, Obviously, you have Jason Tatum, this MVP candidate. You have Jalen Brown, an all-star. You have Marcus Smart, a former defensive player of the year. Al Horford, the sage veteran. And Robert Williams, this explosive freak athlete. Like, you have all of these guys, these entrenched starters and borderline star level, and in some cases, true superstar level players that are a fun to watch every night. But the reason that this Celtics team feels particularly special and magical in my opinion, is because of the role guys, uh, the Blake Griffins diving on the floor, Luke Cornette, uh, you know, jumping awkwardly two times in the air to contest shots. Sam Hauser, who I guess has become just like the world's best catch and shoot three guy. Malcolm Brogdon, Derek White, who I think is like rapidly ascending the ranks of my favorite players to watch in the league. He's just been phenomenal lately. Um, and then bringing in guys like, Mike Muscala to just come in and be another seamless fit to this roster. And, you know, it's good that we have you on Gary, because um, you have a joke in your set that I came across recently about role playing. And uh, I'm wondering, you know, <laughs> in, in particular with regard to the role playing, uh, if you could make, maybe you might want to consider, you know, kind of mixing things up a little bit, you know, you could have a like, you know, role player just looking for minutes and the wife coach <laughs> that isn't giving you the time of day, something like that. I don't know. I don't want to suggest material. You're the professional comedian, but I do want to swing it to you. Um, do you have any kind of impressions about the state of the Celtics rotation and kind of the role players as, as they come across? <laughs> I have to say that um, if my girlfriend was like, I would like 
in the bed to cosplay a, a, an NBA role player. And she said, and I want you to be Mike Muscala. I, it would be a weird prompt anyways, but that would push me over We're the getting, limit. Oh, we, are, we are already in some pretty weird territory, but. <laughs> weird okay, good. Gary, what do you think of the Celtics rotation? <laughs> well, I think, I don't know if you guys watched, I think it was the, the last Celtics Nets game when they said this is this the, the, every statistic in this blew my mind that there have been 4700 ish players in the history of the NBA who've played one or more game and 440 have made an all-star game which means that over 90% of the NBA players have been role players and isn't it I, I think it says a lot about the personalities that are true NBA fans is that, yeah, everybody likes Michael Jordan and Larry Bird. And, but growing up, it was, it was almost obvious. Yeah. Your favorite player is Larry Bird, but to say that shows that you're really not paying attention to the Celtics. So your, your favorite player, if you're really into them is more along the lines of, of somebody like uh, Gerald Henderson or or somebody who's coming off the off the bench to the the sea stings and and players like that and the other thing is that the role players tended to be characters more than the more than the starters they were allowed to be themselves a little bit more because they weren't carrying a a, a brand and and now it's more so than ever but I I, I just feel like this this collection of of Celtics has has so many unusual quirky type players and and with with very varied interests and personalities and it's just and and maybe it's just the case of i i watch them every night so these things are clear but i i really think they they stand out in in terms of of quirkiness and i for, i forget what the subject was but I think Luke Cornett went up against Grant Williams in a just recognizing photos of celebrities and the way Grant did it, it was, it was so clear. This man is a, is a master of pop culture. It, it, just, <laughs> it just blew me away and, and such a fast thinker. I, I mean, I just, all in all, I'm just repeating over and over again, how much, and this is what comes through when I text with Josh and, and Dan, we love these guys. We love this this team. And it was sort of a, a that that Milwaukee game was was sort of the, this is what we love about these guys that that not just Tatum, not just Brown, not just Smart. Horford was out. I, I mean, to play them tough would have been impressive. They a, a free throw and they would have won it. Yeah, uh, Gary, I I was actually talking to someone on the Celtics the other day about how good their in-game uh, little clips and games have been this season. Like, it feels like it's a cut above what it's been in previous seasons. And they said, point blank, the players made it really easy because um, there's just a good amount of charisma. Um, I think there's been in the past few years, but there's just like something in the sauce right now. Yeah. So, Gary, Alex, Justin, it is All-Star Weekend. Uh, very much so not the midpoint of the season anymore, or if it ever was, but uh, functionally the midpoint of the season. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what we're going to watch for this weekend if we're watching at all. But also we'd like to talk about maybe fixing this product because uh, Gary and Alex, I don't know if you agree, but Justin and I think that the All-Star Weekend is not the best it could be in terms of a television entertainment product. But first... Tatum is in the three-point contest. This will be his second go-around. I believe he came in third in 2021. Um, anyone have any expectations that he wins this sucker? Anyone want to go um, up, Alex? Yeah. You know, I, first off, I'll just say it's a little weird that Jason Tatum is even in the three-point contest, given that there are multiple other players in the league that are shooting better than him, at least from a percentage standpoint. But stars draw eyes, and Jason Tatum is probably the biggest star in the three-point contest. So... Um, I think he's going to win, uh, and the reason I think he's going to win has nothing to do with his shooting or the quality of his competition, but it has to do with the fact that if Jason Tatum wins the three-point contest, he will now be two for three in um, All-Star Weekend events, 
giving him a shot at winning the dunk contest and completing the all-star sweep next year. So uh, he's coming for the throne. League watch out. Jason Tatum, uh, who's coming in second, is the only uh, question. Has anyone ever t- triple crowned the all-star weekend? I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, Rising Stars hasn't been around all that long. Yeah, the skills challenge has not existed for all that long, but we'll see. Bring back the like celebrity thing where like Chris Bosch and like Usher are shooting half court shots. I like that one. <laughs> um, Gary, any expectations for the three point contest? Uh, yeah, I, I think I think Tatum could win, but I don't think it's that. It's not like it was when I was growing up, where there was expectation that Larry Bird would win, and that would be part of the Celtics season, Larry Bird winning the three-point contest. The fact that we see so many more three-pointers night to night, so it doesn't feel as as special now because we, we just see guys kind of win three-point contests by going eight for eight and things like that. And, it, and it's just with somebody guarding them, it's not as impressive to see not anybody guarding them. Whereas when we were growing up, the the three point contest was if so the guy would make 23 to win now the celtics make 23 some nights so it's 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 not that unusual i guess the year that was josh hamilton hit like 30 home runs in the first round of the home run derby that ruined the home run derby for me it was like all right (laughs) it'll never be as good as that one yeah Uh, justin any thoughts on the three-point contest it it needs some some tweaking, I think, that Gary was alluding to. We could talk about that in a little bit, but I do think it's possible that, that Jason could win it. But, you know, typically the field is always better than the uh, the single player odds, almost always. Yeah, uh, he would be the, f- the third Celtic ever to win the three-point contest, which would be exciting. Um, he's also going to play in the All-Star game. He's also hopefully going to be joined by Jalen Brown in that All-Star game. Um, and Joe Missoula will be the coach of Team Giannis. So, Gary, I have a question for you because you're on the road. Tatum pretty handily was voted in as a starter by the fans. Um, he jockeyed with Embiid for a little bit. Brown just couldn't catch Kyrie, and I'm biting my tongue, or Donovan Mitchell, which feels more understandable. Out on the road, do you feel like Tatum and Brown are that popular? I I think that the the people on the road recognize that Jason Tatum is kind of a, a wonderkind, but I, I do not think because they don't watch him night in night out that they understand that he's, he's not somebody with potential. He's somebody who's dominating night in and night out. And, and so I also think people's, people are only watching the Celtics continuously in the, in the playoffs. So they'll say, well, he had a a down playoffs or championship series, the the NBA finals, but that's a, it really irritates me that people still bring that, bring that up. And they will, because that's, that's the, that's the media coverage that's so popular right now. But I think he'll erase that this summer and Man, it's going to feel great. Yeah, I I mean, it makes sense that Jalen Brown got fewer votes vis-a-vis Jason because Jason Tatum's on like Ruffles Chips and like Trolley Candy right. and he's like really out there. So it's really a testament to Jalen Brown's just like acumen as a basketball player because he, I mean, I guess as a person as well, but he has, I don't think really any corporate sponsors right now. So whether it's his speaking tours at universities or what he does on the basketball court, I mean, he's still almost became a starter by way of the popular vote, which is not bad. Um, all right, Gary, I know that you have a time constraint, so maybe we let's talk about fixing this weekend. And let's keep in mind that this is probably the, the target audience for this television product is probably like a 17-year-old, but let's assume that it's not, that it's men of a certain ilk and a certain stature like ourselves. What would be something that you would tweak about All-Star Weekend to make it more enjoyable, give it more mass appeal, whatever tweak you want to give it to and why. Um, and I'll stall by giving mine first and you guys can think while I stall. Um, the first is the three-point contest. I'm glad they took it away from Mountain Dew because Mountain Dew ruined it. Um, the 
Mountain Dew ball and like that all money rack and all that crap. Gary, to your point, I just want to see if they hit the shots. I don't need to be doing math on the <laughs> sideline. And now it belongs to Starry, which is what Sierra Mist has become. And so I'm worried that PepsiCo is going to ruin it and there's going to be like the star spot and Starry's low or um, tagline is Starry hits different. So they'll, they'll do something with that. Um, so I suspect Pepsi will have, will continue to ruin it, but the three point contest needs to be saved by just simplifying the money ball was fine. That's it. Just bring back the, the shooting, not the gimmicks, not the green ball, nothing like that. So that's my stance on the three point contest. Anyone can amend a different event or the three point contest as well. So I do want to say that because shooting from further and further and further away is becoming more and more important, maybe they could have further back as well as these different balls. It still counts for the same because it still counts for three points, but you have to shoot that three pointer from further away after another round or something like that. Uh, The perennial complaints about the all-star game counting for, uh, financial stuff that I mean we, we can fix that we can make it so it's positionless we can make it so it's conference list there's ways to make it better uh the dunk contest should be opened up to anyone and I do mean anyone with cash prizes that are significant enough that they will change whoever's life participates in it at least a million bucks come on you want some interest invest in the event let the best dunkers in the world show up maybe no NBA players will participate who cares? It'll still be fun to watch. I, I heartily endorse that one. Um, Alex or Gary, you have a, a fix for All-Star Weekend? Maybe you like All-Star Weekend. I don't know. I haven't asked you ahead of time. No, I th- I, I agree with, with you and Justin on these. I, I really believe that there should be something like to qualify for the three-pointer, you make a shot from the logo or something like that. And during the season and then you're invited automatically and and that would be really fun to make it further out maybe as the as the rounds progress the three point line is moved further out or or something like that and then i loved it when players from other sports particularly nfl players who could really jump high participate in the slam dunk contest also inviting people who are just instagram dunkers would be would be amazing and i can't see how that would hurt financially and and so i i i love those i love those ideas and and also there are there is maybe we could do that with the three pointer as well because there are some there are some coaches lethal shooter comes to mind who i feel like he could he could be versus the field i really i really think he could Cause he's teaching Grant Williams how to make sh- shots and, and Grant missed his first 26, which we're reminded of every time he plays a national game. It is so <laughs> irritating. It's, it's like the person who always has to tell you that Frankenstein's monster was the monster. Yeah. He missed a lot of shots to begin his career and enough already. Jalen Duran is the youngest player in the <laughs> Sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, I have a quick fix for All Star Weekend, uh, which actually has nothing to do with the current slate of events, and instead has to do with an event that everybody has been asking for forever now, and the NBA is very stupid for not including it. Folks, get it together. It's time for the one-on-one tournament. We've been waiting for an eternity. Separate it into smalls, wings, and bigs. Do a whole bracket. The winning teams can have a 3v3 for one, the the top two guards, the top two wings, the top two bigs. Oh, I like that. They're leaving free, massive ratings and money on the table. Let's get it together, NBA. The one-on-one tournament needs to happen. I would even hazard, I would give up the Rising Stars Challenge for that, Alex. I know that's controversial. Oh, I really like that one. Um, All righty, Gary, I want to be mindful of your time and- Thank you so much. I had such a great time. It's great talking to you, and and we'll we'll talk after the All Star break. Thanks. Wait, everybody. can I get can I get thirty more seconds out of you? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. First of all, everyone, check out uh, Born on Third Base, the tour, especially if you're in New England in March and April. Um, as a segue to our buyout conversation, if the Celtics were going to sign one of the following players, who would you want them to sign? Isaiah Thomas, Kemba Walker, or Taco Fall? Oh, Isaiah Thomas. 
Cool. I, I love the, the gusto. All right, Gary, thanks so much. Right. And we'll talk Happy soon. birthday, Justin. Thanks. Take care, man. All right, let's keep it rolling. We are indeed going to talk about the buyout market. Um, to be clear, I don't think Isaiah Thomas, Kemba Walker, or Taco Fall are walking through that door, but nope. uh, I thought it was a cheeky little prompt. Um, anyways, the Celtics, perhaps, likely, will sign someone to that open roster spot. Although, it might be someone that no one is expecting. It could also be a call-up from the G League. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about a few of the names that we have an eye on. Um, A few guys have already been linked to teams, or I'm sure we're in agreement, are not going to join the Celtics, like Russell Westbrook. Not going to be a Celtic. We don't need to talk about that. Um, Importantly, and Justin, can you explain this for us, why the Celtics have a little more cash to burn than the average team? Uh, Well, one could say it's because of a questionable decision i support it but a questionable decision made by donald gallinari and that would be the uh, disabled player exception which is for half his salary uh they can bring in a player on the last well not anymore because i don't think you really can't train anybody but you can sign a player now for 3.2 million dollars which is a little bit more than even a 10-year uh, veteran minimum maximum which is what most of the teams are operating with right now and pretty much all of the contenders so uh, you do have to spend perhaps March and April in Boston, which is a little dicey at times, but you could get a little more of a pay. Okay? Also, um, we, we've said this before, it's not necessarily clear that Boston can offer that many minutes. Uh, ideally, they can offer no minutes, but uh, it is possible that you could be called upon to you know step, step up in the postseason or even the finals. So that's the, uh, the idea. We all have a few names on our list. Let's just run through them. And then at the end, I'll eat some cereal. Alex, take it away. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's important to acknowledge that money and money is small ish and that uh, minutes are very limited on this team, particularly as the role guys are getting more and more comfortable in the rotation. And with the addition of Mike Miscala, whoever is coming in here is likely going to fit one of two categories, either emergency insurance and depth for if somebody gets hurt or a veteran presence who can be a locker room guy that is comfortable not playing a whole lot, basically. Um, So I have two that kind of fit, one that fits in that first category of injury insurance a little more than the other who fits more the veteran guy mold. Um, For my injury insurance guy, uh, the most popular name on the buyout market right now, um, prior to, I guess, Kevin Love getting a buyout today, he'll probably be the main guy now. But one of the most popular is Stanley Johnson, who was released by the San Antonio Spurs. Um, He is currently a free agent having cleared waivers. And Stanley Johnson is having one of his better seasons. Um, He was released by the Spurs, I think, mostly as a cap casualty and for the fact that the Spurs are going nowhere and they wanted to give him a shot to, you know, go play for a team that he actually could play for and make an impact on. He's shooting a career high 45% from deep. Um, We'll see how real that is, but uh, it's been pretty good uh, in San Antonio and his shot seems to have improved a little bit. Um, He's still a pretty rugged wing defender, um, which I think is the thing that he adds the most to uh, if he were to join this team. And I would view Stanley Johnson coming on this team primarily as injury insurance, particularly if Jalen Brown has to miss any more time with his current injury. Stanley Johnson strikes me as an ideal stopgap depth replacement for presumably Derek White then being moved into the starting lineup. He is my number one target. Um, If Stanley Johnson is not available, signed somewhere else, or um, the Celtics don't show any interest in him, then I think the Celtics might have actually already keyed in on a guy that they can plug into their rotation in the form of Tony Snell, who is currently playing for the main Celtics. Um, Many of you remember Tony Snell for his famous uh, clutch points graphic uh, representing the triples or the quintuple zero stat line that he logged in which I believe he played 15 minutes for the Bucks and recorded zero points, zero rebounds, zero assists, zero steals, and zero blocks, um, which is an admittedly pretty impressive. It's hard to do that in an NBA game when you play 15 minutes. But nonetheless, Tony Snell is also a perfectly fine depth piece. He's a solid shooter from the wing. He's got height. He's got length. He's definitely not uh, as fast as he was, and his defense is a little questionable. But if you're That's looking very generous. 
Yes. <laughs> but if, if you're looking for vets who, um, you know, have been around the NBA for a while, Tony Snell has been in some playoff games before. Um, and I think he could come in without, without needing a whole lot of run or minutes to be a player that, um, you know, could actually contribute. So I, I like Tony Snell just fine for that role. Yeah, you're not getting three and D wings with this type of player. You're just, they're not out there anymore. They're already on somebody's roster, right? They're not coming off of it. So what we're really getting at is three or D wings. Uh, and you got one of each, really. Uh, I think Tony Snell can actually still hit a three-pointer pretty well. And that's about the only thing you'd be expecting him to do. Uh, for me, I have uh, kind of guys in that mold whose defense is at best acceptable when they're trying and probably less than that when they're not. Uh, Barton, uh, Will Barton has been connected to the Celtics. He's probably the leader uh, of the most likely person to end up with the Celtics. But as I've said in some of our chats, uh, why have this they not made the move if both parties want to buy out and Detroit is amenable to letting them go? Uh, if you wanted someone similar to that, uh, he's been doing a little bit better in Utah in the one game that he's played since being traded there. Uh, Juan Toscano Anderson, I think, would be fairly similar. They're about the same height, 6'5", 6'6". Six, six, six. Uh, they're both career 35% from three, and both are not that great on defense anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, if that didn't work, uh, this is kind of more in the veteran, veteran presence, though he can probably still give you some minutes if he were needed to. The Lord help us if he were. Uh, that would be more for the reunion of an Aaron Baines. Uh, he does have an NBA out, and it would be really, really cool to see him back in Boston. Yeah, I don't disagree with any of that. Uh, but I think if any of those players were who Boston signed, I would be pretty happy. Um, I think you both identified like why Boston is planning and signing a player. It occurs to me, I've never asked this question, so Justin, sorry to put you on the spot. Maybe you don't know. Could they convert J.D. Davison's contract to a full-time so I don't think that that is like the piece to get them over the hump but if they feel comfortable with the rotation and they just want to you know help this kid who has been a stud in the G League see the playoffs even if he's just from the bench I could be talked into that pretty happily or it would um, be Cabin Gelly more likely because they want to they wanna keep that that they want to keep him cheap as long as possible basically yeah yeah uh ping Yasi Gosselin of Hoops type of you need that explained because Lord knows I'm not the guy to do it. Here's my list. Uh, Alfred Camino came to mind. He hasn't played in the league since 2021 when he, wait for it, signed a 10-day with the Boston Celtics that we, he didn't actually suit up. So he knows the, I don't know, the, the letterhead anyways. Um, he's only 32. I was really surprised to find that out. And if he can still play, and I don't know if he can, um, T is a great defender, smart guy, consummate pro. Not flashy, but uh, always helpful. I feel similarly about Derek Favors, although he's more of a big than a wing. Um, that would just be a really nice insurance piece, like, God forbid. Uh, Robert Williams and Al Horford both went down with injury. You could talk me into that's a fine front court rotation, um, but that, that would still be a bad thing that would happen if those two injuries happened. And then the other two names on my list... Um, I'm not going to say it right. Uh, Bialica, Nemanja Bialica, who yeah. last played for the Warriors. He's got finals experience. I know most of the Celtics now have finals experience, but for me, uh, a big thing about the buyout market would be just like bringing in a veteran presence for the locker room, just like a stabilizing force. Um, again, a best case scenario is that this person doesn't see much action. Um, people made that abundantly clear with my Peyton Pritchard tweet. God, man, people are <laughs> jerks. Uh, anyways, uh, it's uh, I like I prefer to frame it as expectations of excellence, which may be a little bit excessive. But I get it. I just feel like there's injuries in the postseason all the time, and you should be ready for them. So, or foul trouble for that matter. I mean, if you know your favorite starter gets three fouls in the first quarter, guess who's going to play extra minutes? Al Farugamino. So you got to be prepared for that by signing Al Farugamino. Uh, and then finally, it, to no one's surprise the name that I really have on my list, my friend and yours, Carmelo oh, Anthony. Oh my God. He wow. would not be the worst option. You can shoot. I'm so yeah. tired of this bit and I'm so ready for it's the not Celtics. A bit. I'm so ready for the Celtics to win a title so that we don't have to talk about this. <laughs> we can do it next year too. Um, so the Celtics have a 
time before they need to sign a buyout guy for that person to be playoff eligible. We are under the circumstances that as soon as right now, the Celtics can make their move, but it might be the case that everyone takes a little vacation uh, over All-Star. And so maybe we'll talk about this again on uh, next week's episode. Who's to say? Now, uh, to close the episode, I'm going to try Marcus Smart's new Wicked Smart promotional cereal, which is like very youtube of me. Um, Justin is, and Alex are giving me permission to do this youtube thing. Um, mm-hmm. I jokingly said it was a good idea, and then I ran and like literally turned the corner and almost walked into these at the grocery store. So fate put these in my hand. Um, Brad Marchand also has promotional cereal. They're called Wicked Smarts by Boston by Marcus Smart. They've got Marcus on the cover. If, if in the YouTube crowd, you can see Boston in the background. They're just, I don't want to get sued. They're just lucky charms, I think. Um, and on the back, there's Marcus Smart trivia and a social media campaign and another Marcus Smart drawing and all that stuff. So I'm going to try this stuff. If you don't want to watch me eat cereal or hear me eat cereal, like and subscribe and you can tap out. Otherwise, good ASMR material coming, I think. Yeah. I don't know if you have to get real close to that. Alex, I can spray you some. Uh, Cameron, I have two questions. Um, one, what is your ranking system that you're going to be using? Um, and two, um, what kind of milk are we working with here? Important question. Okay. Good question. Sorry if my audio is getting weird. I'm pretty hungry. I might just eat a whole bowl of cereal. Screw uh, it. Do it. A couple of caveats. I like Lucky Charms. Don't love them. Um, for most of my life, I ate cereal without milk. Uh, hmm. which qualifies me as a weirdo. I have 2% hood. Okay. I don't think, Fair. I don't, check me out. My milk opinion is that I don't have strong opinions on types of milk. Uh, that's th- that's fine. Um, I was a little concerned that you were going to go dry, which I think can well, work I have to with, try and try though. Well, it can work with some cereals, but Lucky Charms strikes me as a cereal for which that is not an acceptable opinion. Raisin Bran, for example. Have you ever had mm. Raisin Bran without milk? That is like eating cardboard. Um, Cinnamon Toast Crunch is good dry. It is. And okay, then, so I, I, yeah, your ranking scale, YouTube, please. For YouTube. Um, fairly or not, I'm just going to compare it to Lucky Charms. And uh, if I ate this blind, I'm so sure that I would tell you these are Lucky Charms. They're sweetened toasted oat cereal with marshmallows. Yeah, that sounds Lucky like Lucky Charms. Charms. So yeah, dry, they taste fine. Maybe a little less sugary than Lucky Charms, although a peek at the nutrition label would suggest that they're pretty sugary. Holy moly. We feed this to children? No. A dentist. I think you should adopt them. Do a kip-up after you finish? Does that help the process of a kip-up? No one wants to see me do that. (laughs) I mean, I do. I think you should adopt a five-spoon scale. Um, Five spoons most, one spoon's least. Most likely to recommend or most likely to buy again? Um, let's go most likely to buy again. Oh, man. Holy moly. I haven't had cereal in a long time. Uh, five spoons. I'm really enjoying this. All uh, right. It tastes like Lucky Charms, so I'm enjoying it exactly as much. Well, I'm enjoying it as much as I enjoy Lucky Charms, except that I'm supporting the Young Game Changer Foundation, Marcus Smart's Foundation, which does do good work i'm not being facetious and i'm not supporting kellogg or whoever owns lucky charms so that feels good um yeah marcus i hope you don't eat them because you're an athlete but a little in the morning is not necessarily bad you gotta have some carbs i'll give some so on the back there's trivia question five is who is marcus smart's favorite player to guard in the league is it a kyrie irving b joel anthony c Joel Embiid, sorry. No, it's not Joel Embiid. Joel C, Embiid. Blast to the past. The doc. Um, C, Giannis Antetokounmpo, or D, all of the above. Uh, I'm going to go with D. D. <laughs> it's D, all of the above. Isn't that cute? All right, hmm. well, um, folks, if I found these at Stop and Shop. If you go online, you can buy um, a two-box set, and it comes with a spoon and a T-shirt, I think. Um, Brad Marchand cereal, I bet, probably also comes with that. I hear it is again for people. Next time you're at the grocery store, that's what it looks like. They're great. I'm probably going to eat the whole box this week. All right. So everyone, thanks for listening. Gary, thanks for coming on. And Marcus, thanks for the cereal. Five spoons for six steals from Marcus last night. Let's go. Nice. <laughs>